One of the most beautiful ceremonies that I have been lucky enough to see and be part of in Belurmat is Christmas. And uh, the way it is celebrated there and observed there, it's so beautiful and sublime and elevating. A number of Christians who live in that locality, you know, they prefer to come to Belurmat on Christmas Eve and rather than go out of the way, long way to a church in Calcutta. 100 years ago, in 1914, Christmas was being celebrated on Christmas Eve. And uh, one of the young novices, brahmacharis there, so Brahmachari Abhani, Swami Prabhavanandaji, who founded this Vedanta Society. He was sitting there and he had joined just a few days before this ceremony. And he writes that I was sitting there and a senior monk offered flowers and fruits and cake, and yes, cake, in Milmerumat, to a picture of the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus. And another monk read out, uh, that's still done. I have had the uh, good fortune of reading out the nativity of Christ and and the Sermon on the Mount on Christmas Eve at Belurmat. And that's what, what was being done a hundred years ago in 1914 in December. At that time, the president of Belurmat of the Ramakrishna order was Swami Brahmananda, who was also the guru of Swami Prabhavananda. And uh, Swami Prabhavananda writes that Swami Brahmananda came into the temple, the old temple at that time, and he said, meditate on the Christ within. Feel his living presence. And then something remarkable happened. Swami Prabhavananda writes that all of us were suddenly transported to some other realm where we felt, we felt the living presence of the Christ. It's as if our consciousness was elevated to a different spiritual plane altogether. And a silence, a silence so thick prevailed in the, in the temple at that time. For a long time, people silently meditated. They had that power, you see, Swami Brahmananda, Swami Vivekananda and others, to actually elevate the, the, the consciousness of the people around them to God consciousness. And what was the result? Swami Prabhavaranda writes that after that I realized that Christ was my own. My own in what sense? Just as Krishna is my own and Ramakrishna is my own, Christ is also my own. That's what, that was the result. The Lord Jesus Christ, you find the book of Matthew, that when he found that multitudes had gathered around, and then what he did was, he took his chosen disciples, the apostles, and he took them to the top of a mountain. And then he spoke to them, spoke his heart as it were. And you find the remarkable similarity when Sri Ramakrishna sometimes would call Swami Vivekananda and the other direct disciples, the monastic disciples who were to be the monastic disciples, the apostles. He would call them in his little room in, in the temple garden of Dakshineshwar and he would shut the door. He would look out to see that, you know, nobody is listening and he would talk in private to them, his choicest teachings. And whenever I say, say that, the question in all of your minds and always is, oh, what were those teachings? <laughs> well, there's nothing secret about them, they have been published. But what's important are not those words. What's important is, uh, they have the ability to, Sri Ramakrishna would transmit spirituality. When he said those words, something more, much more than the words was transmitted. When the illumined guru speaks and the competent disciple listens, spirituality becomes tangible there. So that is what uh, used to happen. And that reminds me, it's marginally relevant, but it's a very interesting story. Swami Suhitanandaji, once uh, the, the general secretary of our order who visited uh, recently, he was the sevak, the, the, he used to serve Swami Premeshanandaji, who, uh, who, uh, who was a very senior monk of our order and a disciple of the Holy Mother. 
So once, uh, Swedanand ji was serving him, was doing some little service to Swami Premeshananda, who was old and ill at that time. And Swami Premeshananda uh, said, Come, I'll tell you a secret. And Swetanji said, I knew what secret he was going to tell me because he had told me so many times. I, and he said, uh, Well, Maharaj, go on. No, no, shut the door. Make sure that nobody's listening. Oh, Maharaj, you, you can go and tell me, uh, go on and tell me nobody's listening. Well, let me tell you, Sri Ramakrishna was God Himself. And Swetanji said, Yes, yes, I know. You know, yes I know, and everybody knows, everybody knows, yes everybody knows, and nobody cares. <laughs> you see, we do not really understand what God is, let alone what an incarnation of God is. So it sounds nice to say that so, so and so, the Lord Jesus was God himself, was an incarnation of God, was the son of God, Sri Ramakrishna was an avatar. It's nice to say that and think about it makes you feel vaguely good but what it means most of us do not understand anyway the Lord Jesus Christ what he what what did he say to those few people young people who had gathered around not so young also some of them and who had gathered around him on top of that mountain 2000 years ago he said to them blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven what does it mean? There's this beautiful little book, The Sermon on the Mount According to Vedanta by Swami Prabhavananda. It's, it's really beautiful. And uh, there he gives his own take on the Sermon on the Mount. I was reading this little volume given to me by one of the monks, lent to me by one of the monks last night. And it's a special volume because it's signed by Swami Prabhavananda himself. He gives it to, very interestingly, he gives it to somebody called Mark. Um, but this, this is in the book of Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean? The very beginning of spiritual life comes when we are humble. When we are low, when we, we decide to bend down and look for wisdom, to start searching. You see, we do not, we normally do not think of ourselves as specially egotistic people. The other person has a big ego, but we don't really look at our own ego. Our ego is tied up with so many things, with pride of learning. Oh, I know the scripture. I have studied all of that. The famous uh, story about the Zen teacher and a young man who comes to learn Zen and he says, uh, I wonder if he was American, you know. <laughs> he says that uh, I... I uh, want to learn Zen and the teacher says sit down and he starts to say something and the young man says oh I, I know that I've read that book and the teacher says hmm and then he starts saying something else and the young man says yeah, yeah it's there in that book I, I've read that too and the teacher says hmm I understand okay let's have tea and he starts pouring tea into that young man's cup and he keeps on pouring till, it's, till it overflows and we know that story and the young man said stop stop it's overflowing and then the teacher said, exactly, unless you empty your cup, how can you taste my tea? So, emptying the cup, being poor in spirit. I used to teach novices in, in, in Belur Mat, the Brahmacharis, until very recently. In, in fact, until the, the three days ago before I came here. Usually, you see, the Swamis were sent out outside the country. They are let off from their usual duties for several months. So, um, I went to the General Secretary for order to ask, in the new session, should I teach? Am, am I going to teach? And his answer was very direct. Are you going to eat? <laughs> uh, I said, what? And he said, if you are going to eat, then you're going to do some work. <laughs> so you go on teaching, until the day you go to the United States. And in fact, my last class was the day I flew out to the United States. And the brahmacharis there would ask that, um, what is the right way to ask questions? There is a right way and there is a wrong way. Questions you must ask, but there's a right way and a wrong way. 
what is the right way? The right way is this, that I'm quite sure what the scriptures are saying, I'm quite sure what the illumined uh, souls are saying is correct, but I do not understand it yet. So I'm asking questions to understand. And the wrong way is, I know you're wrong. I'll point it out to you presently. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong way of asking a question. So being poor in spirit, it's the beginning of spiritual life. To give up the conceit of learning, that does not mean you have to be a fool, but to give up the conceit of learning, to, to think that I know everything. You see, there's this, at present there's this disease of, why should I want a guru? My thoughts are good enough. But you see the hidden ego there. My thoughts are the thoughts of this mind. And... There are so many such minds there. Why should it be that my thoughts, the thoughts in this mind, are in any way specially better than the thoughts in those minds? It's only when I become identified with this one particular mind, then I feel these are my thoughts and hence they are important. We don't say it out loud. It comes out of identification with a kind of limitation of ourselves. So, I've met so many people, especially Westerners in, 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 in India. What are you doing? I'm seeking spirituality. Very, very, very good. But what are you doing right now? I'm looking for a guru. How long have you been looking? 20 years. So, what, the guru is there. But what prevents us from coming to, coming to the guru or accepting a guru or finding a guru is not that the guru is not available. It's that we have blocked ourselves. You know? I, I need the best possible guru there is in the whole world because implicitly I am the greatest possible disciple that the guru would be lucky to have, you know. <laughs> I don't say that aloud. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sri Ramakrishna says a person who is thirsty, a person who is really thirsty will take water wherever he finds it. He says literally if there's water covered with scum, he will remove the scum because he's, he'll drink anything. So he'll lap it up, whatever is there. And similarly, when we are really thirsty for God, we will take whatever comes, whatever is sacred, whatever is divine, whatever is inspiring, we'll take it up. We will not go searching, you know, this is not good enough for me, that's not good enough for me. Then Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn. Or they shall be comforted. What is this mourning? And what is, how is it connected to spiritual life? It's not mourning for the usual kind of mourning we have for, you know, for things of the world or people of the world. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, people weep uh, buckets of tears for their children and usually for the children. Children are one of the causes of weeping actually. So <laughs> they weep buckets of tears for the children for money and for anything under the sun. Who weeps for God? Who weeps for God? Mourning is when we are not satisfied with this world. When we are not satisfied with this world. That's the beginning of religion. Freud, not a religious person. Admit, he clearly said, I'm an atheist. But he gave a beautiful definition of religion. He said the characteristic of religion is the belief in something transcendent. Something that is beyond the limits of the senses, beyond this world. So when we are not satisfied with what we have in this world, what we have experienced till now, look at our lives. Everything that we have done, done from our birth till today, till this very moment, we have done so many things. And basically all that we have done is to make ourselves happy. You may say I did a lot of things to make other people happy, but making other people happy made you happy, basically. And all that we have done to till today is to make ourselves happy. Are we happy right now? Are we completely happy at peace with ourselves? We are not. So what we do in this world does not provide Permanent peace does not give us what we are really seeking. 
this is mourning, the sense of this, that though they, though they who mourn, they shall be comforted. They are blessed because they shall be comforted. They shall find that transcendent peace. Then Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are blessed, but, you know, it's what's strange is, why did he say they shall inherit the earth? It's normally, that's what we feel is just the other way around. And what people teach their children is that you be aggressive and you push yourself forward. Nobody is going to give you the good things in life. You have to make a life for yourself. If you're meek, you're going to get left behind. You're going to get crushed under the wheels of progress. So how are you going to inherit the earth? I mean, you may become one with the earth, they'll crush you. But how are you going to inherit the earth? You see, when we, we hold on to this limited ego, we cut ourselves up off from the rest of the world. This is me and mine. This is not mine. I'll try to make it mine by hook and crook, by hook or crook, and that becomes the purpose of my life, to get more and to gather more for this one limited individual. And the whole of life becomes this pursuit. You call it a rat race. The problem with the rat race is even if you win the rat race, you're still a... A rat, yes, a rat. There's not one multi-billionaire who has found peace from his billions. But there are many multi-billionaires who have found peace by giving up the billions. Especially in this country, there's this discussion going on about like, the super rich, many of whom actually take the very wise decision of letting go of their wealth and helping, using that wealth to help others. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those who expand beyond the limits of the ego, those who let go of the limited individuality, you know what happens? Then the entire universe becomes your own. Not legally. The state of California will not recognize your ownership. But, but you will feel at home all over the world. You will feel at home with all kinds of people. Everybody becomes your brother or your sister. The Isha Upanishad says, Ma gridha kasya svidhanam. Do not hanker after wealth. For whose is wealth? Kasya svidhanam. Whose is wealth? And the commentator Shankaracharya, commenting upon that, he says there are two meanings. First, the Upanishad is asking us not to hanker after other people's wealth, of course, because that's immoral, but not even to be attached to your own wealth. What you may, say, you may feel that I have earned it, it's legally mine, but not even to be attached to that. That's the first meaning. You see, the, when we are attached to something, when we say this is my wealth, you know what happens? It's, it's like I hold on to this. When I'm holding on to this, what's happened is this is also holding on to me. I cannot move this way or that way. I cannot move away from this as long as I'm holding on to this. But as long as I'm holding on to money, to wealth, to positions, they are holding on to me. They are holding on to me. They have a claim upon my thoughts, my feelings, my happiness and my, uh, my, uh, my satisfaction in life. They determine. So, that's the first interpretation for whose is wealth. And the second interpretation is of course very profound. It means two things again. One is, there is no wealth that you can lay claim upon. It's a, it's a mirage, it's an appearance, it's maya. What exists is God. The other way you can look at it is, it's all God's wealth. It's not just a thought. It's not just a nice thought or a nice sentiment. It's reality. How much of this earth did we create? How much of this body did I create? How much of it am I maintaining actually consciously? Almost nothing. Something is doing it. You can call it nature. But something other than me is doing it. It's not mine. So, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Here, Prabhupada Ji says righteousness 
it's not just ethics. Uh, righteousness does not mean that those who hunger or to be good, that's very good. One should hunger to be good. But there's something more than that. Those who hunger after God, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. They shall be fulfilled. Those who hunger after God. There's a story of a, of a young man who went to a spiritual teacher and said, uh, when will I realize God? And the teacher said, come with me. And he took him to a, a pond and he caught hold of that young man and pushed his head inside the water. After a few seconds, the man began to struggle. The young man began to struggle. But the teacher would not let him go. Kept his head dunked under the water. And after some time, when the struggles became really quite violent, and then the teacher let him go. And he came out gasping for breath. How did you feel? And that young man said, Well, sir, I, I felt I would die if I did not get the, the, the next breath. When you feel like that for God, you shall see God. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be fulfilled. They shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. A very beautiful saying. When I read this, you know, what I felt was, we have to be honest about ourselves. The first stage in spiritual life is honesty. We don't have to be honest to everybody else, but at least let's be honest to ourselves. We are very far indeed from sainthood. We are far from being saintly. An understanding of what we are right now need not be depressing. We need not feel depressed and sad about it. You can convert that into a powerful spiritual attitude, an attitude of, of prayer to God. Of realizing one's helplessness in this life. There's this great Tamil um, poet and a saint, a predecessor of Ramanujacharya, who prays to God. Look at this beautiful sentiment in one of his Sanskrit hymns. The prayer goes like this When I consider my weaknesses, when I consider my sins, I cannot in any way actually ask for thy forgiveness. It's unreasonable to ask for forgiveness. So I'm completely helpless. Do with me what thy, thou will. Imagine that feeling. If I'm completely surrendered to God. Another devotee says that, uh, that God, you test people to, to see if they're worthy of thy grace. But I shall test thee. How? It's because I am so utterly hopeless. I am so utterly full of weakness and sin. That I am not worthy. But if you can rescue me. Then you have passed my test. I am really the best candidate. The best, best test of your power. To rescue people. So if that is our condition. If there is even any truth in that. Then. What should we do to others? First thing that we should do is show mercy. Is we should forgive. We should forgive. Because God, the, G, the Lord promises, be merciful. If you are merciful, you shall obtain mercy. You shall obtain mercy from the Lord himself. He gives us an out. A way out, a powerful and, and, and a very easy way out. If we cannot make ourselves worthy of God's mercy, there is a way out. Show mercy to those who are around you. Show forgiveness, give forgiveness to those who are around us. Let us, give, let us forgive those who hurt us in any way. Those who cause, cause trouble to us in any way. Let us forgive. There are so many such beautiful incidents in Ramanujacharya, again, Ramanujacharya's life. There was a great devotee of Ramanuja, Kuresha. Um, some of you may know the story. He was a householder devotee of, of, uh, of God and a disciple of Ramanujacharya. And this Kuresha, once, when they were being persecuted by a king of a neighboring kingdom, 
he enabled Ramanujacharya to escape with his disciples and presented himself for the king's uh, persecution for his revenge and the king actually ordered him to be tortured and, and, the, and, the, and the general who did that you know he actually blinded Kuresha and once and many years later when Kuresha was wandering the land and he came back to Ramanujacharya Ramanujacharya came and embraced him with tears in his eyes and saw what Kuresha had sacrificed for him and then he said you ask for anything ask for anything I shall give it to you and the first thing which Kuresha asked for was that man that general who blinded me who took my eyes bless him that he may have God realization before me imagine not just forgive and Rabanujachar you know with the tears in his eyes he went into ecstasy when he heard that blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy one of the most terrifying things I have ever read was a poet I've forgotten who the poet was he writes about the day of judgment L throughout our life we are experts in making excuses for ourselves he says he says you make excuses for yourselves throughout your life but what shall you do you poor soul where you are face to face with one who knows how to ask questions that's God on the day of our death so who is God beautiful description and a rather terrifying description the one who knows how to ask questions so blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God I shall not dilate upon this, this is a subject for many lectures the whole of spiritual path is this Chitta Shuddhi, Sattva Shuddhi purification, inner purification blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God we talk about meditation, Samadhi there's this monk, it's a real story there's a monk in the, in the Himalayas who said in Hindi Samadhi to asane, Samadhi is easy I shall give you Samadhi the highest spiritual experience in meditation in two minutes but the condition is come to me with a pure heart I said oh <laughs> so that condition unfortunately it's a very tough condition blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God and Swami Prabhavananda ji here gives the example of Swami Brahmananda and indeed any of the illumined souls the first thing that you first sign there's no way of understanding who has seen God or not but the first sign of a truly uh, peace of, of, a, of a spiritual person you feel peace when you come close to such a person even the most troubled heart feels at peace Swami Prabhupada writes when Swami Brahmananda touched my head in blessing it was like taking a cool shower in the midst of, of a fever we are in a fever the fever called worldliness being touched by this person there were monks who were quarreling among each other and a complaint came to Belurmat let's take action against these people and Swami Brahmananda said don't do anything I'm coming there and he went to that monastery and he did people expected he's going to call people and he's going to talk to them and have meetings so that they can settle their differences he did none of that he said all the monks should come and sit and meditate in front of me every day in the morning and they started doing that and after a few days they gave up their quarrels everybody rose above their own pettiness that's the you know it's the children of God they are the peacemakers blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven even after we attain some spiritual height it will not lead to an end of actually an end of physical or, uh, or mental or social suffering the world is as it is it will continue but now our suffering also becomes a form of spirituality you can see the so many examples from the, from the Christ himself who was crucified and on the cross he said forgive them for they know not what they do down to Sri Ramakrishna when he was passing away from cancer and even at that time he kept on giving spiritual instruction to those who came to, to seek all of them they suffered but in their suffering their lives became a blessing their lives became a light for our spiritual life I pray to the Lord Jesus Christ to bless us all now and in the years to come 
that we may grow in perfection. Growing in perfection means being perfect in these things which he has spoken about. There are eight of these, uh, of these teachings which he has given, uh, which I just read out. These are instructions for perfection. These are instructions for perfection, for becoming worthy of the vision of God, for becoming worthy of God. Chesterton in his humorous way says that there are infinite ways of falling. You can fall this way or that way or in front. There is only one way of standing straight. And the Sermon on the Mount teaches us how to stand straight in the eyes of God. Thank you very much. Thank you.